I woke up sometime after midnight. And I kind of remember like coming to, like I had maybe passed out or whatever, but. Trying to get through that moment, you're, you're praying, okay, I need to just get out of here. So we didn't want to run. But after that, I was like, I want to investigate this. For many people, the search for Sasquatch is a happenstance endeavor. People of various backgrounds and life experiences come together to search for the Sasquatch, connected by their own individual experiences with the creature. But as different as each person may be, when observed as a whole, the Sasquatch topic forms a curious through-line in each one of their lives. A prime example of this is Olympic Project member David Ellis, who did not begin his own investigation into the Sasquatch phenomenon until much later in life. I'm uh, David Ellis. Uh, I live on Whidbey Island. My uh, prior job experience was in the lighting industry. I worked for a uh, large lighting manufacturer selling to distributors and contractors. So that's kind of what my work history has been. I'm currently retired, fully uh, invested in the Bigfoot conquest, <laughs> so to speak, and um, in the middle of writing a book about unknown sounds. David's introduction to the Sasquatch topic was a dramatic encounter he had when he was very young. My Grandfather had an 80-acre farm near Battleground, Washington. And sometime in the late 40s, early 1950s, he had an experience that he told the grandchildren about. So I recollect I heard this story about 1958, 59, somewhere in there maybe six, seven years old at the time I heard it. And the story goes that he was cutting hay, it was in the summertime, and up jumped a five foot tall monkey and ran across the field and hopped the fence and was in the woods. So from the time I'm five, six, seven years old, there's been this notion that there are monkeys in the woods. So now fast forward, I'm 11 years old, it's 1963, and a group of kids from the neighborhood, we went to our local haunt, which was called the Stump Field. And it was called the Stump Field because it was logged with the old buckboard method where they would springboard and go up about 12 feet in the air and then chop the tree down from that, leaving these large edifices behind. And the reason they did that is they wanted straight timber. So there's this 140 acre field that we would go to that would have these big tall edifices and we could hide and we could play all sorts of fun games. So it was, uh, it was a great little place for us to uh, while our hours away. It was a Saturday afternoon, maybe four o'clock-ish or so in the afternoon. There were cows that we had to kind of negotiate. And for some odd reason, we thought it was peculiar, but they were all huddled down in one corner of the field. So as we get to the other side of the field, one of the kids picks up a stick and whacks a overhanging limb of a large maple tree. And from there, all heck went crazy. We really couldn't see too much into inside of the fence line uh, because there was so much brush, but I could see that there were alder trees and they were doing this. And 
I, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. The next thing that I recollect is, I thought maybe something was tumbling out of the trees at first, but then I realized, no, limbs were being snapped off of the tree, maybe, you know, two inch size limbs, and about 12 feet up in the air. And we just, I, I, I couldn't fathom what I was seeing. And then something cut loose with a scream that I later described to my dad as an elephant trumpeting and a lion roaring all at the same time. And this vocalization lasted 10 to 12 seconds. It was really long. And I kind of remember like coming to, like I had maybe passed out or whatever, but whatever that vocalization was, I was less than 50 feet from the source and it was overpowering. So it just literally knocked us to the ground. And when, when it stopped, I can remember kind of coming to and just yelling, run. <laughs> and away we went. <laughs> that was my experience with something that was unknown. And then the following week, we had a library class. And in that library class, the librarian would ask us, usually did anything interesting happen over the weekend? Up shot my arm like a rocket and I told the story of what we just heard and she thanked me for such a colorful story and yeah, have a seat. <laughs> and then about 30 minutes later when the class was all reading a book, I feel this tap on my shoulder and it was Mrs. Holcomb, the librarian, and she said, David, I want you to come talk with me for a minute. So I went with her and I thought, well, oh God, now what? Am I in trouble or whatever? And then she opens up with, now, can you tell me a little bit more about that scream that you heard? Do you think it could have been one of the cows down at the, that you said that was in the field? No, I know what a cow sounds like. <laughs> could it have been a cougar? You said it had a kind of a high pitched scream, no. I know what a cougar sounds like. And the more that I described it, the more she started nodding her head. And then she says, I, th I think I have a book for you to read. She said, it's an adult book, but it was just published a couple years ago. And I think it may have answers for you. And that book was Ivan T. Sanderson's Abominable Snowman, Legend Come to Life. It was published in 61 and my experience was in 63. So how my librarian knew about this book, you know, makes me wonder what she knew. Because <laughs> she said it would have answers for me, and it did. So that's kind of how I have grown an interest in the, in the subject. It wasn't an obsession like it is now, it was an interest. And then, of course, when the Patterson-Gimlin film came out, I, I was all behind that. I could tell just by looking at the movement that that wasn't a man in a suit. <laughs> at the age of 15, David had been exposed to not only the most famous film footage of a Sasquatch, but also one of the seminal works of Sasquatch research with Ivan Sanderson's book. It would seem that he was prime for a lifetime of Sasquatch research, but this was not the case. First there was girls, <laughs> then came marriage, then came kids, and get kids through college. So it was kind of after all of that that I was following things on the internet. There was lots of different blogs, and I think there was Henry Franzoni's Internet Bigfoot Conference um, page that I, I, I went to quite a bit. The BFRO had stories that I love to filter through. So that, that, that kind of rekindled my interest. And it wasn't until 2005 when I decided, okay, that's it. I'm going to a conference and I'm gonna see what this stuff is all about. So I did and got to rub shoulders. And the, it was so funny, we were in a meet and greet line and in front of me was Bob Gimlin. And I went, that's Bob Gimlin to my, my kids. <laughs> and I'm, you know, starstruck, eyes this big, Bob Gimlin, that's Bob. 
<laughs> and Tom Yamarone, he saw that I couldn't take my eyes off of Bob and he goes, excuse me, do you want to meet Bob? <laughs> well, of course I want to meet Bob. So yeah, I got to, to meet Bob. And so now I'm all starstruck. And then at the conference, you know, is one right after another of people that I've been following on the internet, telling their stories, telling why this is real to them. And then, you know, Dr. Meldrum just kind of cemented the whole thing with as much evidence on foot morphology as you could handle. And the, the whole thing really inspired me to the point where I called Tom Yamaroon about four or five months later and I said, Tom, I got to get out into the field. I got to find out what everybody is seeing and hearing and experiencing. And he says, I, I got a few people for you. And he sent me to Paul Graves was one of the, the people. And then Christine Walls. I got to meet Christine and the group is called Washington Bigfoot Research, WAPFER. They helped me get into the uh, field and take me to places where they had experiences and I started to have my own experiences. So it just kind of uh, blossomed from there. David's personal journey into Sasquatch research eventually led him to joining the Olympic project in 2010. While many in the community now consider him to be an audio specialist, David's skills extend further than just audio analysis, and he has been involved with the collection of multiple tracks and other pieces of evidence over the course of his involvement. The one aspect of all this research that stuck out to David more than the rest, however, was the aspect of audio recording and analysis. Going back to the, the Wobfer days when I was working with them, there was a three or four folks that were using what's called a bionic dish, which is a method of enhancing audio from the environment. It gives you an ability to hear more clearly and some of the softer sounds at a distance. Sounds we couldn't hear without using this particular device. And they were hearing things in the brush moving around. And I just, that just enthralled me to no end. In the year 2006, my kids gave me a bionic dish as a Christmas gift. So between Christmas and New Year's, we went to a location that we were having all kinds of activity. And usually the activity involved uh, when you got there, a wood knock that would announce your presence or uh, that you were there. I had this, th this bionic dish and I could hear sounds and things that were going on that others could not. And I was hearing something that was walking, starting at my one o'clock and then into my two o'clock and then to my three o'clock. But there was also something that was at the 12 o'clock that was doing the knocking sounds as well. Something was trying to get behind us, near as I could tell. We would move forward, and when we would do that, there would be this rapid fire wood knocking. Bam, 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 bam. So we, we stopped, and that whatever it is is still moving behind us, and we moved forward again, and then the same thing. Bam, 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 bam. Like it was not very excited that we were coming closer. <laughs> so we decided that, hey, we're probably upsetting whatever that is, and that we should maybe give it some relief and leave the area, which, which we did. But that's just a story that I can tell you that wasn't recorded. So you have to take my word that I heard what I did. And I thought, you know, that's not very scientific. The way that this should work is I should get that recorded. So that week, I went out and bought a digital recorder and then I figured out how to, to run audio to a recorder and also monitor it in the field at the same time. So the following week, went back to that location, hoping to get you know lightning to strike twice. As I'm putting my gear together, the researcher that's with me says, did you hear that? And I said, no. And she said, 
I just heard a wood knock. So now I'm scrambling really fast to get my, the gear all together. We jump into the wood line. Uh, she grabs some rocks and starts hitting the rocks together. And we got a response like right away. And then, so we got a back and forth interchange and I'm recording all of this. Another one. And I'm just ecstatic. You can hear yells, you can hear screams. I was just literally beside myself because now, besides this story, I have actual proof that that happened. So that was uh, a really exciting. So from then on, I, I just kept working on my gear, trying to get better gear, get better recording equipment, and um, kind of got a reputation around witnesses and other researchers. And so that just inspired me to keep doing more and more and more. But it wasn't until I started working with witnesses and convinced them that if they were to record every night, we would have way more data. So it ended up being the case. I started working with all kinds of different witnesses and and they would record overnight. And now I, I, volumes, volumes of audio recording are coming my way. And it got to the point where I couldn't keep up with it. And I had heard this gentleman that, that goes by the name of Monongahela in the Bigfoot world. And he is a crypto linguist trained by the government to identify sounds. So he and I started conversing back and forth and he got me to uh, understand that reviewing audio visually through a spectrogram is the way to go. Because I was complaining to him that, Mono, I'm, I'm reviewing this audio and I'm kind of falling asleep. Because <laughs> it's, it's, you know, a one for one. It's uh, one minute of recording and one minute of listening. So, you know, thousands of hours adds up and you just don't have that kind of time. So he explained to me the advantages of going that route, which I ended up doing, uh, learning how to review audio visually and correlate sounds that are suspicious to possible biological animals that could make these sounds. And got to the point where I'm now comparing through the use of the Macaulay Library of Sound uh, catalog. If I thought maybe this could be a coyote, I would go and review coyote audio and learn the voice prints, if you will, that coyotes, when they make a vocalization, what those sounds look like. Not only what you hear, but what you see. And that became very, very, very powerful tool to me. And so, once I started doing that, my analysis, I'm spending the same amount of time, but I'm covering so much more territory and learning so many things. Unbeknownst to David at the time, his work analyzing audio and spectrogram would go on to inspire many researchers and reshape the way the Sasquatch community approaches audio research. One such researcher is Chris Spencer, whose own introduction to the Sasquatch topic also happened at a young age. As a kid, you know, it's, I wanted to believe in Bigfoot, but I, I kind of took my dad's stance. My dad was extremely skeptical, but it was always cool to think about Bigfoot. 
My mom always told me, you never know what's out there. We don't know everything. So I was intrigued with the stories and stuff growing up. And I told you about the experience I had with my dad in Packwood. But it wasn't until like the early 90s when I went to college and I took Anthropology 101. I had Grover Krantz as a professor. I had no idea that he had anything to do with the subject. And evidently he would devote one lecture a year to the topic of Sasquatch. I walked into the classroom and there was the Gigantopithecus skull that he recreated plus a bunch of casts on the counter as a, what the heck's going on? And he proceeded to give a lecture on the topic. He went through how he recreated the Gigantopithecus skull, went through cripple foot cast and what his thoughts were on that. And then he had the Patterson Gimlin film. He had a, I think a third generation copy and he actually played it on a projector. And up to that point, I'd seen it on TV and back, you know, in the seventies and eighties, TV was not that great. So, you had this jerky footage on not great TV. It looked like a guy in a suit. And I could, I, that's what my dad said, that's a guy in a suit. But when I watched an actual copy of the film on screen on the projector and Grover went through it, I left that lecture believing that animal was real. And he explained it perfectly. The other thing I was in awe was here you had an actual accredited scientist interested in this topic and validating it and that's i would say that lecture is what changed my opinion on the subject from that point on i absolutely believed they were real and i st started following the topic a little bit more in a similar fashion to david ellis chris didn't get involved with the sasquatch subject until much later than his initial exposure to it I followed it like everybody else, and in the late 2000s, YouTube was really becoming a thing, and I started watching YouTube. And of course, the podcasts were coming on, and I was listen I started listening to Sasquatch Chronicles like everybody else, and I was interested. In it. I really liked the idea of doing the audio recording because I'd heard David Ellis talk about it a number of times. But you know, I was still, I wasn't like going to go out in the field looking for it. But I want to say 2011. I'd been fishing Rife Lake with a friend and we had an experience where there were some knocks on shore. And Rife Lake, you have the Gifford Pinchon National Forest butts up to the south end of it. And we'd been fishing for smallmouth and we'd had something large breaking branches and moving along the shore as we were just trolling down the shore throwing buzz baits. When we had stopped for a while, we fished and something knocked when we went to leave a half an hour later or so. But I. You know, that was intriguing to me, and that's when I found the BFRO. And I actually filled out a report for that, and I was talked to a BFRO guy. But anyways, fast forward to 2013. I was definitely into the subject. I was following it, but I wasn't actively doing anything on my own. And 2013, my son and I, he was 13 years old. I'd gotten him a two-man tent for Christmas from Walmart and he wanted to go camp in it for spring break and his spring break started April 5th. It was raining, it was a cold year, the snow level was probably 2,000 feet and it was raining over on the west side. I said, well, well, we'll jump on Highway 14 and we'll go east and find a campground east to camp on. And we came to Skamania County Campground, weather was better and it had opened April 1st and we were the only people there. It's basically a sliver of timber, three to five acres. You got the Columbia River on one side, and then you got Highway 14 on the other side, and there's actually a baseball field behind it. Well, we set up the tent and just did a little walk. We camped right next to the river, and we walked up the river, and we came to a spot where someone had walked down to the river, and there was an old degraded track. And ironically, my son was like, oh, look, Dad, Bigfoot and kind of laughed about it and we walked up into the timber and there's a little trail that went back to the camp and we started walking that trail and as we were walking that trail i was noticing freshwater clams and they were all open and clean just laying piled up on this trail and they weren't broken or chewed on and i thought it was odd it could have been very well been like uh, crows or even you know some kind of uh, corvid bird dragging them back there but usually you find them broken usually you find them chewed on but i noted it and we 
start heading back to camp and we kind of come around a bend and there was a vine maple that was six feet up and it was twist broke and wrapped around this fir tree, this old fir tree. And right below it in the fir needles was an impression that you could see toes in. And that's when we're like, wow, this is crazy. We went and got my tape out of my Jeep and that print was 18 by nine. And so now we're like, okay, this is interesting. And we started looking around the camp and we found another 18 by nine impression in the, in the leaves. And these were just impressions. They weren't, you know, I never even thought of casting them, but it was all fresh stuff. And we found some other trees that were broken off at the top. That was just really weird. Well, we were kind of, we were excited because that limb twist was cool. And that impression in the fir needles, I took a picture of it was impressive i mean you could see definitely see the heel and you could see toes in the furs fur needles well we went fishing after that and we're excited about it and came back to camp and while we we're roasting hot dogs it started sprinkling so i had two small blue tarps and some paracord and his walmart tent didn't have a rain fly so i i tied those up in a way that it covered us so we wouldn't get wet it got dark and jameson went to bed about 9 30 and uh, I had, <laughs> I was getting creeped out, admittedly, because I started, you know, everything's cool and exciting when it's light out, but as soon as it's dark out and we're literally the only people there, it was getting creepy. And I finally went to bed and Jameson was out. I woke up sometime after midnight to movement around the camp. And my first thought was elk. Because the snow level was still so low, I know the elk would go down and feed in that baseball field and and be down around close to town and and so my first thought was there's elk moving in there but it didn't it didn't sound like elk it was it was just ever so often some movement and just as I was about to fall asleep again something grabbed the tarp from one of the tarps and started pulling on it and those tarps were moving back and forth and I just sat up and I cursed and Jameson woke up and I told him, oh, it was just a bad dream, go back to sleep, and he did, and I sat there, and because I had been just, I was right on the cusp of falling asleep, I laid there, and I was telling myself, did I really hear what I heard, because I'm like, you're psyching yourself out, you know, you're thinking about that limb twist and that track, and I was just at that point where I'd talked myself out of it, and kind of starting to relax a little bit, and it happens again. <laughs> And this time, though, I had the fob to the Jeep. I hit the panic button and set off the, the horn and the lights. Woke Jameson up again. I was like, it was an accident. Go back to sleep. I didn't go back to sleep after that. And I sat there. Nothing ever approached the tent. Or, And that's the thing. I didn't hear any movement approaching our tent when this happened, which you would think you would. But after that, nothing happened near the tent again. But I would ever so often hear brush movement or movement in the campground and at one point I actually heard splashing in the water and I'll be honest I was so scared I was actually shaking I'm fighting with myself in my head get out of the tent you know and I had my handgun with me and but I just I couldn't do it I was just that I totally freaked myself out well I, it was around 4 a.m there's two knocks. I used to say one, but I went back and actually looked at my notes the other day, and that's a testament how bad your memory is. There was actually two knocks, and they were power knocks. It sounded like a rock hitting a tree right behind our tent, not far at all. And I sat there, and for whatever reason, about 10 minutes after that, I was like, this is silly. I'm getting out of the tent. I got out of the tent. I built up the fire, and I waited for Jameson to get up. And when he got up, I asked him, I go, what'd you hear last night? He goes, I heard you cussing. And then I heard the horn on the Jeep going off. And then I told him what I heard. And he just looked at me and said, dad, I don't want to stay here again. And I'm like, we're not. And we packed up and we left. But after that, I was like, I want to investigate this. I'd listened to Shane. I'd listened to David. And I was like, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to put a recorder. I'm going to find a place to record because I like that idea. And that was 2013. I spent all of 2014 ambulance chasing as they call it you know i went to the bfro public site and i was chasing reports that were 
around Skamanian County mainly because that's where I had my experience. And it was close to the end of 2014. I was actually on my way home and I was driving up through the mountains and coming out around on the backside of St. Helens. And it dawned on me, it's like, you dummy, you know where, you know where the elk herds congregate in the winter. They, they get, you get huge elk herds on the north side of Mount St. Helens in the Tootle, it's the north fork of the Tootle River. There's actually a mountain range, it's called the Tootle Range, that runs between the north and south fork of the Tootle. I know in the winter time the elk congregate down there and there's usually a, a large die off because the, the elk, at that point in time, the elk herd was so big, the state was even having issues because they weren't getting enough food. And I was like, well, if I was an apex predator, that's where I'd be hanging out, especially in the winter time, because you have a lot of die off. And then in the spring, you also have calves being born and, you know, bears regularly prey on calf elk and as well as cougars. So I'm like, well, that's if there are Sasquatch around, they're going to be around those elk. So right, I think it was February of 2015, I went into an area I call X1 and I started leaving a Tascam recorder out and visiting. I was up there twice a week through 2017 doing recording and just hiking the area and actually recorded some stuff and basically that's what started it. The location known as X1 was Chris's first dedicated research location, and almost immediately the area showed signs of a variety of activity. Located near Mount St. Helens, Chris took me to the location to share some of those experiences in the same spot where they happened. So, in 2015, February, I decided I was going to start coming into this area to try recording because I knew a lot of elk were in this area, especially in the winter time and in the spring. As I was walking down here by myself, I had my little Sony digital recorder. I got down here and it was, it was uh, a warm, for February there was no snow on the mountain, it was warm dry here. And about 11 in the morning, I get right about where we're at now. And this coyote starts just scream howling, just constantly. I know now what it was. It was doing a warning scream howl. But as I got further down the road here to the bend, there's a marsh right there. It was coming towards me and it freaked me out. <laughs> and I decided to leave. I called a friend and he's like, yeah, get out of there. And he said he'd come up with me the next day. But it was just one of those one of those instances I was just freaked out, but there was a coyote warning location call in the middle of the day, and the coyote was just repeatedly scream howling. Well, after that, we came back the next day and started hiking around, and I picked out my first stump, which is right down here, put a recorder up, started recording here. And where we're going right now, the first suspect thing I ever recorded was in March, about a month after I started recording, and it was a power knock was definitely not it, there was definitely no one up here when it occurred and it was it was cool and from there on that's when I started coming here on a weekly basis for about two years pretty much every weekend I was up here and you'll, you'll notice that it's an old growth stump this used to be a, a cedar and pine forest before it got logged in the early 20th century early 1900s so there's all these old growth cedar stumps and uh, white pine stumps around this area and at the top of them there's red huckleberry growing out of every one of them but when i first started that's where i would stick my recorder in the middle of one of these stumps and this was x1a and this is i recorded some stuff here but like i said we can't go down to x1b anymore it's off limits um but x1b is where a lot of stuff happened and what what reason I moved down to X1B I tried all over in this area but X1B that seemed to be 
the focus of where the our target subjects were hanging out and there's a a marsh right above it and a, a, a bunch of cedars between another marsh below it and there was a big stump in the middle that i would put the recorder in but the reason i started recording there is in early may i had up to may i had gotten some knocks and i got a couple suspect stuff that was distant stuff wasn't sure vocalized now i'm pretty sure it was probably coyote but i was getting some knocks every so often but me and a friend of mine ryan williams he's a he's an iron worker like me he's we both were kind of laid off between jobs at the time so he did a lot of hiking with me we came in i had put a recorder out on the side of this trail and it's a road now but it was just a trail by this particular marsh and as we're walking in from this point we started hearing this whistling and it sounded like another human being whistling down in this general area and ryan's like is someone down there and i'm like there was no one else parked where you can park to come in here because it's a gated area and uh for about 20 minutes as we walked down we would hear these whistles and luckily my recorder which was down there was still going so i captured the whistles and it sounds like a person but they're just like monotone two and three note whistles and it sounded like a little kid who just learned how to whistle and was didn't know any tunes and that was like nine in the morning and so that's when i i labeled that marsh area x1b We got to the recorder, heard the last whistle, and I turned to Ryan and I go, well, we can either go towards the whistles, which was back on the other side of this marsh in this cedar grove, or we can walk away and see if it follows us. And Ryan goes, let's see if it follows us. And I was just as, I was just as nervous as him because it was just odd, it was bizarre. And so we walked out, nothing happened. We never heard anything, but Three le weeks later, we walked back in there where we'd heard the whistles. Okay, uh, once again, we're behind the marsh over there where the track was found and the game camera is. We're in the timber and we wanted to come back through here because this is where we uh, assumed the whistling was coming from. But here's a big, a big bed. Something laid down right here. Got all these ferns dead inside of it. And we found this area where something had pulled up the entire root wad of uh, three big fern plants, picked all the ferns off, and there was like a mat of ferns on the ground between two trees. Just an odd place for, I don't, I don't see an elk laying on this hill like this it's just odd and there's no other beds around it and you got all these look at all these ferns that are obviously they've been broke and laid down in it hey, don't theorize this could be a bedding type situation it's probably all perfectly natural Is that roll ferns? it's just weird those those ferns have been ripped up and put in there one fern frond was actually up in the tree like eight feet up but it was just like someone made a, a little sit down spot of ferns right behind this marsh hey, there's the end it's been ripped off it's been put in here it's been broke off and put in here all these dead ferns were put in here i don't know that deer and elk do that and I did go through it looking three weeks after the fact, looking for hares. And the only hares I found, I sent to Cindy Dose, and they end up being elk and, and deer. But it was just one of the oddest things I've ever seen. And it was right where we were hearing those whistles come from. 
And that's what started. I recorded Ape Fit in that same general area. Multiple times walking in here had stuff happen. I came in by myself, which I never liked coming in here by myself, but I came in by myself and I'd actually come down the trail over here after walking through the marsh up there. And as I was over there, I heard the elk call. And this was early July and they'd calved late. So there was a lot of calves in here and you'd hear them, I called them squeakers. You'd hear them calling back and forth and I could hear the, the the elk moving through this timber between that trail and this trail and I was coming to this trail so I'm above it and I hear the elk running through the brush in the forest and I hear the squeakers the calves calling and then I get down to this bend to turn to go down this trail and everything goes quiet and I had this air pro video camera at the time and at this time I didn't wear a recorder on the back of my head I had my recorder stuffed in my hoodie pocket right here which doesn't do any good at all and i'm holding this air pro camera talking about the elk and i get about 50 yards down this trail and it dawns on me everything's quiet and about the time it's dying on me everything's quiet up on the hillside over here What the f was that? And I just froze. If you watch the video, I sit in the same spot. I stand there for two minutes and 36 seconds and I don't move. And I, I say, what the F is that? And I'm talking to myself and I'm like, it's gotta be a bear. Hey bear. It wasn't a bear. And I'm like, I really wanna get to my game camera and recorder so I actually, holding the Air Pro, I pulled out my 357 and started walking down the trail finally after the standing there forever. Wow. I hope uh, audio picked that up. I don't know what that was. I've never heard that in my entire life. Hey bear. Or whatever you are that made that noise. Uh, how about you stay up there and let me go check my game camera. And I won't go up there and bug you. I didn't get more than another 50 yards. It took me a long time. I was walking slow. I got another 50 yards down and I heard heavy movement. Stomping and brush movement above me. But also below me. So that I had two somethings on either side of me and at that point the light switch went off in my head and I was like okay f this I checked the game camera Friday I'm gonna go I ain't going back here anymore there's stuff moving on both sides of the road now I'm leaving And I hiked straight back up here. I was, I was really scared, honestly. Hey, the elk are down there. It's gotta be. But something else was up here and it freaking... I don't even know how to describe it. It was like a man grunting, but it was loud. And I got shit moving around me now. Picked a good day to come by myself, evidently. Holy So I don't know what I encountered down there. Well, I'm pretty sure it was Sasquatch, but it wasn't the elk that yelled at me and they didn't stomp around me, but that was probably one of the most intense experiences. And I, I, I don't think, 
I would come in by myself to this point, but I would never walk down to X1B again after that by myself. And some, uh, some other stuff happened. Interesting, a lot of times when stuff would happen that we would actually hear is when I had a female with me. I had a gal that I was dating at one point. We came in here and there was a power knock. Another gal who was just a friend. We were coming out of here one year I think it was 2016 and we had rocks thrown at us from above and they hit the tree. Rebecca and I came in here the first time I brought her in here. She'd gone off trail just for a second to take a leak and as she's coming back to me there's a sharp just one whistle and she looked at me she goes elk and I'm like yeah shaking my head because it wasn't an elk and it was really close to us. I just I don't know. It seems like a long time ago now, but it's kind of cool being here right now. The place still gives me the creeps. It always did. <laughs> I never felt comfortable here. Um, even with people, I never, I've never been in X1 and not felt a little iffy. The forest around St. Helens covers a swath of several hundred square miles and is located in Skamania County, the county with the highest number of reported Sasquatch sightings in Washington State, according to the BFRO website. One such report was investigated by none other than Rebecca Slick. So I took a report on the BFRO for a Sasquatch sighting or Bigfoot sighting. Uh, out here there were some people coming back from one of the overlooks late at night and there's a whole bunch of bridges on this road and on one of the bridges as they were coming down in the dark they saw something in the middle of the bridge and it wasn't a bear clearly wasn't a bear and the one girl starts yelling monkeys don't live here monkeys don't live here as they're driving past something with its arm up in the headlights as they go by it and that happened in 2014 and I didn't see the report until years later turns out that was around the same time period that Chris was researching in the same general vicinity and uh, he found that interesting because of the size of it that was described it was a smaller Bigfoot and he's always thought that the area that he was researching there might be a juvenile involved. So it was just really interesting that that was the exact same time period. The lady hadn't reported it until a year later, and then I didn't find the report until a few years later after that. So at the same time he was researching, there was other activity going on. You interviewed the lady? I did, yep. And she so, seemed um, credible? Yes, definitely. And I actually was able to, she was able to get me in contact with the passenger in the car as well. So I was able to speak to both of them on the phone and uh, put all the pieces together. So. Always seen in the field together, it is difficult to imagine Rebecca or Chris investigating independently, yet both of them started in just that way. As is the case with many people, Rebecca's path led to a life of Sasquatch research in a very natural yet unplanned way. I don't know how old I was, but I was little. I was growing up in Western Pennsylvania, but my dad's family would come out to the West Coast pretty much every year to visit family and do road trips during the summer. And uh, over the years, he had picked up stories about Bigfoot and Specifically, he talked about the story of the, the female Bigfoot that would kidnap children and throw them in the basket on her back. And so that was scary as kids. And we, we, we didn't really think of it as a real creature. It was these were Native American stories that he'd picked up while traveling. I don't think we really took it too seriously. He talked about how there were some Bigfoot sightings 
in our area in Western Pennsylvania, but then he also clarified with, well, but those people were on drugs in the 70s. And so, oh, okay, we just wrote it off. He also talked about the, the Yeti. And for some reason, I feel like growing up, we latched onto the Yeti more than Bigfoot, I think because it was something in another country and that made it really fascinating. Meanwhile, we had the Chestnut Ridge right there and didn't even, didn't even realize the significance of it. Yeah, just little kids running around pretending we were growling outside the tents trying to scare each other as kids while camping. But that was, we didn't really take it too seriously. It wasn't really part of our lives other than that. In the car you said you met Stan Gordon? That was later on. That was, um, he was speaking at the Greensburg Library. My sister and I went and got to listen and chat with him. That was neat because I'd read, I'd read one of his books. I was in my 20s then. I had started to have some interest in Bigfoot after kind of putting together, I guess you could call encounter, it was a situation while hiking that I wasn't sure at the time what it was. And then later on learning about Bigfoot put together that it was kind of standard Bigfoot behavior. And so I started reading into things and came across his stuff. And I didn't even really at that point know the significance of Pennsylvania with Bigfoot until later moving out here. I just hadn't put it all together yet, all the information. Well, do you mind talking about that experience you had in Pennsylvania? Um, In 2005, I was hiking in West Virginia and honestly just went out with someone for a picnic on this overlook. Beautiful valley, you could see the bridge from there and stayed too long, hadn't packed flashlights, started walking back in the dark, just enough, just enough moonlight. We're like, okay, we can see the trail, we're good. Started hearing movement in the woods below us because we're hiking on a ridge and off to this direction we're hearing movement that was sounding a lot louder than just a deer and i grew up on a farm so i'm running through all the scenario of okay is someone's horse out someone's cow you know we don't have elk out here <laughs> just going through all the different animals and then it starts clearly being footfalls like a very large person, very heavy footfalls. And every time we would stop so that we could hear it better, we'd hear one more and then it would just be silence. And so we'd go a little further and we'd hear that and we'd stop, one more footfall, silence. And then after a while, we started hearing, for lack of a better term, speech. And it wasn't anything intelligible. It wasn't any kind of language that you, you know, that I'd ever heard on a movie, ever learned in school. It was nothing. It didn't sound normal. And the only thing I could think of at that moment, unfortunately, at the time, was that it was demonic because of how guttural and how menacing it sounded. And at, at the time, thinking it was demonic, it was like you're just trying to get through that moment, you're, you're praying, okay, I need to just get out of here. So we didn't want to run um, in case it was some animal. And we ended up running into some people that I guess were going to stargaze or something that had headlamps on. It was a group of about 15 people with flashlights. We probably looked like we'd seen a ghost because of how worked up we were, because at that point, before we saw those people, the whole way going down that trail, I actually thought we might die because I did not know what to expect just because of how evil it sounded. And I don't even think we talked about it on the way home. I mentioned to one other friend who had hiked there before 
what had happened and she said oh i've heard demonic screaming in that same area it's like okay i don't need to i don't need to go there again i'm going to write this off as just some kind of really creepy experience i never want to have again i'm never going to go there and i just kind of wrote it off and tried not to think about it for a lot of years and then i heard the sierra sounds and the um, one that they call the samurai chatter was the closest that, that hearing that took me right back to that moment and actually made me have to deal with everything that I had filed away from that. And it got me interested in what it was. And the more I read, the more interested I got in it and eventually heard of the Olympic project. And that's why when I got to come out here for an expedition, I was so thrilled and I don't know, I'm, I'm so glad that happened that way. I am not happy about the experience <laughs> and the way it happened, but I think it led me here. And there's so many, so many wonderful friendships that have come from that. And you can't put a price on that. So I don't know, <laughs> it's worth, it was worth it in the end. For many people, this experience alone would have been enough to drive them away from the topic of Sasquatch entirely, but it only speaks volumes on Rebecca's bravery that she began to dive deeper into the subject. Well, I was still in Pennsylvania when I was reading all the books and starting to find the groups online that were, were doing things. Believe it or not, I was just starting to get access to the internet outside of the library. <laughs> and so I started trying to read, read everything and heard about the Olympic project. And I had family that was living out here and came out to visit. They had already been to an Olympic project expedition. There was gonna be another one. So they took me along and I got to meet people and hike around up on the OP property and up behind there and everything. And, that was really neat because there was the, there was a little bit of that factor of, oh, these are people I've heard about and they're doing great things and the nests had just been discovered. And so there was all that going on around that. And I got to talk with Derek. I had just been reading a whole bunch of Bigfoot books. I had tried to concentrate on finding things like John Green and Dr. Bender Noggle and people like that. I was showing a lot of interest in Bigfoot in general, but wanting to wanting to help out somehow and just, I don't know, we were just talking for a while. Eventually I became a member and eventually I got to actually, actually got to go to the nests and then just kind of fell into doing this with, with them. So it's been pretty, pretty fascinating and just kind of, I'm still surprised sometimes how it, how it happened. As part of the Olympic project, Rebecca is one of the few people who study the nest area on a regular basis. Additionally, her skills in plant and animal identification have been an essential element of the team. However, I believe her greatest contribution to the group are her documentation practices. While many members of the Olympic Project record audio and take handwritten notes, no one has gone as far as documenting the daily practices of Sasquatch researchers as Rebecca has. During the course of creating this series, Rebecca has provided me with hours of footage that she's filmed over the years, capturing important events and situations as they happen, lending credibility to the other members' stories. More so than just basic documentation, however, Rebecca's camera work displays clear intentionality in framing and subject matter, revealing a natural talent for filmmaking. Without her contributions to the Olympic Project, much of this series would not have been possible. 
Although the majority of her documentation work has been shown in the episodes regarding the nests, it wasn't long after relocating to the Pacific Northwest that she began to work closely with Chris and lend her documentation talents to the area of X1. In the next episode, we'll take a look at some of the incredible audio recorded at X1, as well as a piece of potential video evidence captured in the area. The study of Sasquatch is no easy task, even more so if you're by yourself. But this subject has an interesting way of drawing people together. Friendships and camaraderie now exist between the most unlikely people. And as long as each new generation builds on the last, and people come together to find an answer to this mystery, we'll keep moving along the road to discovery.